The ability to solder is an extremely useful addition to any modeler's skills. Nothing else will allow you to construct as fast and with more strength when working with metal parts. Soldering's not magic. There's no secrets. There's no secret handshakes. To have reliable success with soldering requires that you're soldering with the correct materials, you're using the correct solder and flux, and you have an adequate heat source. Not all metals are good candidates for soldering. Brass, copper, and some steels are usually the best. The solder that I use is 50-50 tin lead solid wire solder. I prefer it over 60-40 because it's a little stronger and seems to flow better. 50-50 melts at about 5 to 10 degrees hotter than 60-40. Successful soldering requires that all the surfaces need to be clean. But no matter how clean, when metals are heated, the surface oxidizes and will prevent proper heat transfer, resulting in a cold solder joint. Flux cleans the oxidation and keeps the metal clean while soldering, as well as aiding the flow of the molten solder. I use an acid flux, and my favorite is no corrode. Using separate flux rather than a cord solder allows maximum control over where the solder flows. In order to take advantage of this feature, I keep a syringe loaded with flux so that I can put a small amount of flux exactly where I want it. Unlike rosin core solder that's used for electronics, acid flux does a better job of keeping the parts clean while soldering, cleans up easier after soldering, and is less corrosive on soldering tips. Soldering can be done with a torch or an electric soldering machine, but for the purposes of this video, the heat source I'll be referring to will be an electric soldering iron or a soldering gun, since they are by far and away the most common, affordable, and easy to use. Regardless of the type of heat source, it needs to provide enough heat so that all surfaces to be soldered are raised to the melting point of the solder. This principle can be frustrating for the novice. Soldering electronics involves mainly uniform small components, but in modeling, we may be soldering something as fine as photo etch or thin wire to a piece of brass sheet. It doesn't take much to heat the photo etch, but it'll take considerably more heat to raise the temperature of the brass sheet. And depending on how large the sheet, or how you have the parts jigged together, you might have created a giant heat sink. For instance, take a look at this jig I made to hold the components of the rear suspension mount on this 112 scale McLaren. The components are just rod stock, but they're screwed down to an aluminum block that acts like a terrific heat sink, so in this case, I needed a lot of heat. Soldering irons like this are designed mainly for the electronics field where the componentry is small and the temperatures are critical. It's a nice setup for a lot of small modeling tasks, and if you're mainly working with wire and photo etch, this type of iron would be my first choice. For larger parts, you'll frequently need a larger heat source like this soldering gun. In all honesty, I do the majority of my soldering with a soldering gun like this, and in fact, all the soldering on these parts was done with this gun. The tip can be easily modified by filing it to a smaller size with a more acute angle to fit into tight spaces better. What's nice about the gun is that it can be left plugged in and heated up quickly only when I need it, and I keep it hanging under the bench where it's handy. Heat transfer is the one basic principle that governs successful soldering. In order for solder to flow properly, all surfaces must be heated sufficiently to melt and flow the solder. The result is termed an intermetallic alloy. In order to have proper heat transfer, everything in the process needs to be clean, and you need to have a sufficient amount of heat. This starts with the tip of the soldering gun. The tip of the soldering gun needs to be cleaned and tinned. Tinning means that the tip has a thin coating of clean solder. In the case of a copper tip, the tinning process starts by applying some flux to the tip. When heated, soldering flux removes the surface oxidation from the tip and allows the solder to flow. A salomoniac block can be used to clean the hot surface and move the solder around. Any excess solder can be removed with a brass brush, and there's no need to be flinging hot solder all over everything like magic dust. The soldering tip needs to be retinned from time to time, depending on the amount of use. Many of the soldering tips used for electronics are plated and don't require as much effort to clean and tin. 
For these tips, a curly metal pad is a good way to clean the tip. For temperature controlled iron such as this, using a wet sponge is not recommended because of the extreme changes in tip temperature when the tip is on the sponge. When you're through soldering, clean the tip and retin if necessary. This is a good habit to get into because it will preserve the soldering tip and leave the iron ready to go the next time you need it. A good way to get a feel for the way solder flows and the concept of heat transfer is just practice tinning some scrap stranded wire. Flux the wire. Then put the solder on one side of the wire and the hot soldering iron on the other. Watch how the heat from the iron heats the wire and draws the solder down. Pay attention to how the solder follows the flow of the hot flux. You need to keep in mind that the longer you heat the metal, the more it will oxidize. The flux is only effective for a short while, so you'll have a lot more success if you bring the pieces up to temperature quickly. This is why it is important to use an adequately large heat source. Trying to heat a large area or bulky piece with a dainty soldering iron will generally result in a lot of frustration because there will be so much oxidation that the solder won't flow and the result will be what's known as a cold solder joint. A good solder joint will appear shiny and the edges of the joint will blend into the surface of the metal. A cold solder joint will look like a blob and frequently have a dull rough look. A cold solder joint also results if the pieces move while the solder is cooling so it's important that the pieces be securely held together. There are any number of ways to hold the pieces together during soldering, from ready-made adjustable holders all the way to custom jigs. Just keep in mind that the way the parts are held together might draw heat and therefore increase the overall heat necessary. With a lot of photo etch, the parts are bent to place and only need to be secured. In the case of this photo etch tank fender, the two pieces are bent to shape but the result is a pesky gap between the side and the top. A small amount of flux is applied in the areas where you want the solder to flow and several bits of solder are shaved off and placed in the area of the joint. I prefer to handle the flux and solder this way because it gives me maximum control over where the solder flows and how much solder will be used. The areas not touched by the flux are oxidized so that acts as an anti-flux preventing the solder from flowing where I don't want it to go. All this minimizes cleanup later. Another useful technique is known as sweat soldering. In this method, one or the other pieces that are being soldered are tinned first. Then the two pieces are brought together and heat is applied to melt the solder creating the final joint. This method is especially handy for soldering two pieces of dissimilar size securing a piece that is pinned or where you want to minimize the buildup of a solder joint. A typical application for sweat soldering would be securing two pieces of telescoping tubing. You want the pieces secured, but you want to maintain the gap between the two pieces so that you still have the illusion that the two pieces are movable. Tin the smaller piece of tubing. Tinning is easily done by melting a small amount of solder on the tip of the iron then applying the molten solder to the piece you're tinning. To minimize the amount of solder on the piece being tinned, you can brush off the soldering tip and reapply the hot iron to the tinned area to draw off any excess solder. Apply a small amount of flux to the inside of the larger piece of tubing. Position the two pieces and apply heat to the outside of the larger piece. The result is quick, strong, and clean. Because we're making models, not electronics, the appearance of the joint is critical, so no matter how careful you are, many times you'll need to clean up the solder joints. Solder can easily be scraped off or shaped with a blade and smoothed with sandpaper. Avoid using a file because the soft solder will get stuck in the teeth of the file and doesn't always come out very easily. Before finishing and painting you need to clean off the flux. You can easily clean acid flux off with hot water and detergent or solvents like acetone, lacquer thinner, ammonia, or pretty much anything that will degrease the area. It's a good habit to get into anyway when you're working with metal that will be painted. As you practice and use soldering more and more, you'll gain confidence to the point that it becomes as reliable as using liquid cement. Just like the capillary action of liquid cement, good heat transfer is the key to successful soldering.